I would like to call the meeting to order. Um, with that said, if we have any public comments, any citizen desiring to address the hospital board should turn in a speaker card to the board secretary. If the citizen comment pertains to an item of the agenda today, the comment will be heard earlier in this meeting. Otherwise, it will be heard, heard towards the end. Speakers are asked to limit their comments to, to three minutes. Vendors, suppliers, or any other person seeking hospital contracts awarded on a competitive basis are reminded that their ability to address the board may be restricted by the terms of the invitation for bid, request for proposal, or any other purchasing criteria. Lastly, the board has established a claims adjustment review panel comprised of representatives of the board, the medical staff, administration, and legal counsel to review and negotiate the settlement of claims. Accordingly, the board will not entertain comments or discuss or negotiate claims at this meeting. All right. Tonight, uh, we're going to approve the orders of the day. Can I get a motion? Mm -hmm. And a second. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Um, and can I get an approval for the minutes of the meeting of May 21st, 2024? Aye. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Um, we have no board report, so we will move on to David um, in regards to our cell awards. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am. Uh, to, to share with you uh, two awards today. We're going to start with our May Excel Award winner, and I'm going to ask Jamie Parker to come out to join me. Jamie. So, Jamie Parker is a patient care representative of two in our cardiovascular diagnostics. She has been an employee of SMH since 2019. Her colleagues describe her as the captain of the CBD ship because she keeps everything running so smoothly throughout the week. Jamie has a wealth of knowledge and she, is willing to, and she willingly shares with others. She is a kind and caring teammate who is always happy to lend a hand to anyone in need. She helps coordinate the labs and work, workflow with grace and a smile, despite frequent interruptions and challenging situations. But mostly important, most importantly, Jamie treats every patient as they were one of her own family. She goes out of her way to give our patients personal attention and make sure they are comfortable throughout their entire visit. She truly makes a difference in improving the patient experience. Congratulations, Jamie, and thank you for everything you do for our community. Thank you for everything you do for us, for our patients in our community. Yes. Uh, sure. um, 
it's truly an honor to receive this award. So I just want to thank you, uh, the, whole, the whole organization, and the leadership team of the who are here and some are remotely um, watching as well. Um, to me, the true essence of this award is the testament that innovation and great ideas partnered with the right group of people from leadership to staff is basically key to having, you know, have, having that right people, the right environment, the right culture gives us the right outcome, quality outcome um, that we all aim to have. And that is ultimately as a nurse and a nurse leader, that's kind of like the purpose that you want to have long term. Obviously, I'm grateful again for the leadership team, for the staff, especially for Five Northeast, who has embraced the vision that we created um, for SMH Venice. Um, and I'm, I'm truly grateful for that. And of course, my uh, best supporter, my husband, is here. Looking very proud of that. And my family is uh, even far. So I'm from the other side of the Thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of the board, thank you and congratulations. Um, next, we are Dr. Fierica is here to announce our FSU medical students. Dr. Fierica is in Thank you. I'd like to uh, introduce our healthcare providers of the future. Um, we have the third year medical students from FSU that are here with us today, and we have the PH students that are here with us today. Is Nicole Benzi here? Dr. Benzi will ask her to introduce them. You'll notice that if you, in your hand, in your packet, all of these students are from Florida, with one exception, in the, in, both in the uh, FSU medical class as well as the PA class. So these truly are our healthcare providers. We hope we'll stay with us in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. As the Sarasota Regional Campus Dean, I'm thrilled to introduce you to our new class of third year medical students as well as our PA students. I have um, Megan Bordoni, who is the Program Clinical Education Director for the uh, PA program with us, and she will be introducing the PA students. I'm extremely uh, proud of all of these students. Not only have they demonstrated academic success, but they also have excellence in leadership and a dedication to service. For our medical students, they have already completed two years of training in Tallahassee and now are in the Sarasota region to hone their clinical skills for two years. I'm going to have the students introduce themselves in a minute. Yes, thank you. Like she said, I'm Megan Bordoni. I'm a PA. I'm also the clinical education director at FSU. Uh, it's important to mention I'm also a PA that works here at Sarasota Memorial, and I have for almost 22 years. I worked last night, as a matter of fact. Why is that important? It's because I started my PA career as a student here in Sarasota, just across the street. So I was a UF uh, student. Uh, both schools I'm a fan of, uh, but <laughs> having us come in and having any health profession students really important to building your future healthcare providers. So thank you for having us. And on that note, I'm going to introduce our future healthcare providers in Sarasota County. Hi, my name is Tanzila Hassan in my hometown in Tampa, Florida. Nice to meet everyone. Hi, my name is Sadia Kapati. I'm also from Tampa, Florida. Hi, my name is Rushab Shah, and I'm also from Tampa, Florida. Hi, my name is Rebecca Gibbons, and I'm from St. Petersburg, Florida. Hi, my name is Basima Ali, and I'm from Tampa, Florida. Hi, I'm Nicole Yulipan, and I'm from Sarasota, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Mark here, boy, I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm Parker Wilson, I was born and raised in Tallahassee, Florida. I'm Casey Easterling, and I'm from Tallahassee, Florida as well. My name is Annalise Kelbraith, and I'm from Palm Harbor, Florida, right up the road. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jack Finner. I'm also from Tallahassee, Florida. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Mandarin, Mascarenas, and I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. 
Hi everyone, I'm Erin Thomas and I'm from Tarpon Springs, Florida. Hi, I'm Gabby Chalela and I'm from Trinity, Florida, Tampa. Hello, my name is Alia Malik and I'm from Gainesville, Florida. Hi, my name is Stephanie Thompson and I'm from St. Augustine, Florida. My name is Madison Flowers and I'm from Tampa, Florida. My name is Lindsay Collins and I'm from Cape Coral, Florida. Hi, my name is Paula B. Gorgialu and I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. Hi, my name is Elia Bourne. I was born and raised in Jamaica. Hi, my name is Justin Esty from Orlando, Florida. Hi, my name is Nazifa Khan from Leesburg, Virginia. Hi, my name is O'Shane Hill. I'm also from Jamaica, Florida. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sage Keckstein. I'm from Bradenton, Florida. Hi, I'm Christine Morgan. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Hi, my name is Lynn Pierce. I'm from Miami, Florida. Hi, I'm Abigail Vargas. I'm from Wachula, Florida. Hi, I'm Tina Schrader. I'm from Everett, Pennsylvania. Hi, my name is Chody Vu, and I'm from Tampa, Florida. Hi, my name is Irene Maney, and I'm from Tampa, Florida. Thank you all. <laughs>
is our medical staff report. Um, Dr. Gierica? Uh, yes. Yes, I just have one motion um, for approving the uh, Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System Organ and Tissue Donor Procurement Policy as recommended by SMH Sarasota and SMH Venice Medical Executive Committees. All in favor? Uh, yes. Any opposed? Great, motion passes. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Temple? Thank you, Madam Chair. I also would like to ask for a motion uh, in regard to approval of delineation of privileges. Um, I'll be asking for a motion to approve the Sarasota Memorial Hospital of Sarasota delineation of privileges for urology, palliative hospice, pulmonary care, transition of care, radiology, <laughs> cardiology, endocrinology, ENT, gastroenterology, general medicine, infectious disease, neurology, oncology, orthopedic surgery, trauma, and cardiothoracic, advanced practice professionals, and CRNAs, as recommended by the SMH Sarasota Medical Executive Committee. Um, second. All in favor? Yes. Opposed? Yes. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. Dr. Temple. Next, we have Dr. Perrin. He is on the TV screen over there. Can you hear us, Dr. Perrin? Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Um, I would ask for a motion approving Sarasota Memorial Hospital Venice delineation of privileges for urology, palliative care, hospice, pulmonary critical care, transition of care, radiology, cardiology, endocrinology, ENT, gastroenterology, general medicine, infectious disease, neurology, oncology, orthopedic surgery, surgical, and for CRNAs, ABPs, as recommended by SMH Venice Medical Executive Committee. So, second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, motion passes. Thank you, Dr. Perrin. Thank you. Next on our agenda is the secretary's report. Uh, Sharon, will you please read that? Tuesday, August 27, 2024. Can you hear me? No, not that. Is it okay now? Yes. Tuesday, August 27, 2024, from 9 to 9.30, we have a closed session of the hospital board meeting. From 9.30 to 11 a.m., we have the educational workshop that will cover cybersecurity update on Tuesday, September 10th, 2024, at 5.01 p.m., we have our preliminary budget and millage hearing. And then on Tuesday, September 24th, 2024, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., Finance Committee. From 11 till noon, Mission and Planning Committee. From noon to 12.30, closed session, hospital board meeting. From 12.30 to 2 is our financial review, board issues, and board lunch. From 2 to 3.30, SMH Physician Services Incorporated annual meeting. From 3.30 to 4.30 is our board meeting. And at 5.01 p.m., our final budget and millage hearing. And that's the end of my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Sharon. Next up um, is our treasurer's report from Bridget. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move approval of the bad debts and charity care for the month ended May 31st, 2024, in the amount of $21,516,000, and the month ended June 30th, 2024, in the amount of $24,015,000. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, a second. Can I get a second? Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Sorry about that. Um, and now we have Jeff Lundbacher, our Chief Financial Officer, to go over our financial highlights. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, so this presentation um, outlines our financial results uh, through June of uh, this year, 2024. So the 
three quarters of our fiscal year um, done at this point. So this first slide shows our total revenue um, our, for the system, for all of our operations, our month to date, total operating revenue uh, for the month of June, uh, 158,775,000 versus a budget of 151,557,000. The set of uh, bar charts on the right, our year to date operating revenues, actual of one billion four hundred sixty one million three hundred eight thousand versus a budget of one billion three hundred sixty seven million and forty seven thousand. Next slide is our total expenses also for the system. The month is on the left, and so our total expenses for the month of June one hundred forty eight million four hundred seventy five hundred. 475,000 versus a budget of 144 million and 12,000. And moving to the right, you see our fiscal year to date numbers 1,366,145,000 versus a budget of 1,295,829,000. Moving to the next slide, the resulting operating income from the previous two slides. For the month of June, uh, it was 10,301,000 versus a budget of 7,545,000. That's an operating margin actual of 6.5% versus a budget of 5.0%. On a fiscal year to date basis, uh, on the right, you see our operating margin uh, through three quarters is 95,163,000 versus a budget of 71,218,000, an operating margin of 6.5% actual, versus budget year to date of 5.2%. Moving on to our statistics, um, this is hospitals only. So our average daily occupancy uh, through the three quarters so far, uh, 891, which is the bar all the way to the left, versus a budget of 875, that's a length of stay at Sarasota campus of 4.43 and a length of stay at Venice campus of 3.70. On the right side is admissions and observation cases. So actual of 60,500 for the year versus a budget of 56,745. Next slide, more statistics, um, surgery cases and births. Births, pardon me, on the left, surgery cases, a total of 25,203 versus a budget of 24,550. And births, a total actual of 3,579 versus a budget of 3,290. Next slide, outpatient registrations. On the left, uh, our actual year to date is 457,431 versus a budget of 460,913. On the right side would be our total emergency care registrations, an actual of 132,917 and a budget of 134,645. And then our last slide on my financial report is case mix index. Uh, the fiscal year to date numbers all the way to the right. Uh, the first two bars are the Sarasota campus, um, a budget, excuse me, a case mix index for all patients of 1.82 versus a case mix index for Medicare only patients of 1.89. And for Venice, the case mix index for all patients of 1.50 versus a Medicare-only case mix index of 1.51. And that concludes my report. Madam Chair, I'm happy to ask any questions, answer any questions. I think we're good. Thank you so much. Um, and next, we're going to move on to our committee reports. Um, first up is our finance report from Sharon. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the minutes of the March 26, 2024 Finance Committee were approved. Next, we heard from Jeff Limbacher, CFO. He presented the proposed fiscal year 2025 operating and capital budgets. 
The proposed fiscal year 2025 operating budget has an operating margin of 5.0% and a proposed ad valorem millage rate of 1.0420 mills. The proposed fiscal year 2025 capital budget totals $326 million, inclusive of funds to be sent, spent on the SMH Venice Expansion, Research and Education Institute, Cancer Outpatient Tower, IT Platform, Routine Capital Items, and other strategic and growth projects. There was discussion, and at this time, I move approval of the fiscal year 2025 budget and to set the fiscal year 2025 preliminary millage rate at 1.0420, which is same as the current millage rate, and to set the first public hearing to adopt the proposed budget and set the preliminary millage rate for September 10th, 2024 at 5.01 p.m., and the second public hearing to adopt the budget and to set the millage rate for September 24, 2024 at 5.01 p.m. Both hearings to be held in the old board room on the first floor of the Sarasota Memorial Hospital, Sarasota, 1700 South Tamiami Trail, all as recommended by the Finance Committee. Can we get a second? All in favor? Yes. Yes. Great. Motion passes. Thank you. May I continue? Mm -hmm. Next, we heard from Lori Bennett, Vice President of Human Resources. She gave a presentation on the child care programs for Sarasota Memorial with a request to purchase a property on Hyde Park for $1.837 million for future child care expansion, which will enhance this critical benefit for staff. So at this time, I move approval of the purchase of 1991 Hyde Park for an amount not to exceed $1.837 million and authorization for administration to execute the documents necessary to complete this purchase and further move to approve the addition of this amount to the fiscal year 2024 budget as recommended by the Finance Committee. Can we get a second? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And this concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And Mr. Carter, Mission and Planning. The Mission and Planning Committee met this morning. There were two presentations given to the committee, one board update and one approval. The first presentation was an overview of the Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System electronic health record and enterprise platform landscape. Jeff Lindbacher, Chief Operating and Financial Officer, and Pam Ramhopper, Chief Information Officer, discussed the evaluation process to move the platforms to an enterprise-wide system in the future. The team will bring additional information to the board in September for final approval. The next presentation was the MRI edition at the Venice Bypass Healthcare Center. The inventory leadership team to review the benefits of adding an MRI at the site to improve patient access to MRI services in South County and to, and to decompress existing MRIs within the system. At this time, I will approval of the funding for the addition of an MRI at the Venice Bypass Healthcare Center in an amount not to exceed $5,400,000 as recommended by the Mission Planning Committee. Do we have a second? Second. Great. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Carter. 
Next up is our president and CEO, David Barringer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am going to um, do my uh, normal um, uh, organizational report card first, which should be behind me. Uh, look at the five areas of concentration that we look at service, people, quality, finance, and growth. Uh, we'll look at what our goal is and then uh, what our, our score is um, year to date and projected for the, for the fiscal year. So, first up is uh, area of focus is service. We have a goal of having eight out of ten of our uh, areas that we survey um, be it at or greater than or equal to the uh, 75th percentile and likelihood of recommending. I'm happy to report that we are actually getting 10 out of 10 on that right now. I'm going to show you the detail here in a second. In the next category, in the, in the area of uh, its people, we have our goal of having 83% um, of our employees that have been hired with, um, within the year, the fiscal year of 2024, still be employed by the end of the, um, the, fiscal, the, the fiscal year of September 30, 2024. Um, we are exceeding that goal as well at this point at 88.44%. Next area of concentration is that quality. We have a goal of being at um, less than 0.8 on a combined overall standardized um, infection rate. Uh, I'm happy to report we're exceeding that greatly at 0.53. Uh, just to remind um, the board uh, and the public, our, the expected goal on that is 1.0, so we already set our goal to a bit lower than um, what the expectation of national average is. Next up is finance. We've already heard from our CFO, Jeff Lumbacher, um, but we have our, our goal is having our operating margin uh, in a rating agency format, be it 5% or higher. Uh, we are currently tracking higher than that at 6%. And then finally, in the area of growth, we have two different goals. The first being our inpatient admissions and outpatient observations, being at 75,456 or higher. Uh, we are tracking higher than that for the year at 80,524. And our outpatient registrations being at 1.18 uh, million uh, or higher, and we are tracking higher than that as well as 1.2 million. Looking a little deeper on the patient experience report card, uh, you see, um, to me, it's a very welcome uh, indicator of offerings. So, all of our, uh, all 10 of the areas that we, we survey, which you can see on the far left hand side, um, and they're likely to be recommending, then the next score over, the, the, in the middle is our score, and then you have what the median national score would be and the 75th percentile score, which is of course what we compare ourselves to. So congratulations to the staff on that. Next up was um, uh, US News and World Report. Uh, ranks SMH among the nation's best um, for 24 types of care. Uh, this month, the U.S. News and World Report recognized SMH among the nation's top hospitals and for 24 medical specialties, procedures, and conditions. SMH was ranked among the 50 best hospitals for specialized rehabilitation in the top 10% for six high-performing specialties and earned top ratings for 17 high-performing procedures and conditions. Of nearly 5,000 hospitals evaluated every year, each year by the publication, SMH is the only hospital in the Sun Coast region that has ever made the U.S. News 50 Best Hospital list. In addition to its national rankings, SMH continues to rank among Florida's top five hospitals. Sarasota Memorial was also ranked among America's top 10 best hospitals in the 2024 hospital quality study released by Money Magazine, coming in at number seven. The methodology for Money's 2024 list, list leans heavily on quality and safety indicators, including low mortality and readmission rates, as well as patient satisfaction and experience of physicians. SMH Sarasota immediately made the short list of high quality hospitals because of its multiple national quality rankings including a five-star rankings from the Federal Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services. The publication's rankings also factor, also factors in the skill and expertise of practitioners caring for patients at the hospital. Newsweek ranks SMH a great workplace. Sarasota Memorial recently made Newsweek's national list of two, America's greatest workplaces for 2024. 
Of the thousands of employers evaluated nationwide, SMH ranked among the top of the nation's largest employers in the 5,000 plus category across 78 different industries. The recognition was based on performance metrics and survey topics covering compensation and benefits, training and career progression, and work-life balance and company culture. SMH and Florida State University present research and innovative rewards. The Sarasota Memorial Research Institute and Florida State University College of Medicine held its 2024 Interprofessional Research Conference on the SMH Sarasota campus a few weeks ago, showcasing research that is enhancing care throughout Southwest Florida. Nearly 250 healthcare professionals attended the event featuring more than 70 presentations SMH and FSU leaders presented awards supported by grants from Sarasota Memorial Healthcare Foundation. And there's a picture of our new research and education building that's coming online soon. Our new garage is expanding um, parking capability capacity. Sarasota Memorial recently opened the new 650 space Floyd um, parking garage on the north end of Sarasota campus. The garage, which is part of the Milliman Milman Pover uh, Cancer Pavilion Project has significantly increased parking capacity for both patients and staff. Another parking garage currently under construction on Arlington Street will open in the coming year, adjacent to the new Kuchowski Research and Education Institute. The two new garages will have had nearly 1,000 spaces for our busy campus. First Physicians Group celebrates 30 years of serving our community. 30 years ago, a handful of physicians at Sarasota Memorial came together to strengthen primary care in our community. Today, FPG is made up of approximately 600 physicians and advanced practice providers across the region who see more than 840,000 patients a year. Despite ongoing national and statewide physician shortages, FPG has been able to successfully recruit primary care providers and highly trained specialists to ensure comprehensive and advanced care for our residents in the area. We continue to provide our podcast series um, uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Uh, right now we're featuring a series focused on nutrition. Uh, so please join our uh, SMH clinical dietitians for a series of conversations uh, surrounding nutrition. Um, and you can go to smh.com slash podcast to, to hear all those, or you can go on the Apple or however you get your podcasts. And Madam Chair, that is my report, and I'm happy to answer any uh, questions. Thank you, David. Does anybody have questions for him? No. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, would you mind addressing the issue that's kind of floating around as far as privatization of the hospital? Can you kind of help us out with that? Sure. Um, so, I've heard, I think what you're referring to is people having discussions about privatization and maybe not sure exactly where um, the hospital is uh, or, or has been in the, in the past. I, I can just say that um, I have um, had the privilege of serving this organization, this community, for almost 20 years now, uh, in 10 years as the CEO. And for all 20 of those years, um, I have fought extremely hard, along with this board and the other members of the administration, um, to maintain um, our, the public status here. So much so that, that um, when uh, Governor Scott uh, aggressively tried to, to force us to, to become private, we were, we were um, on the other side of that story and, and fought that quite a bit. Uh, more recently, we've been able to join with, uh, uh, with Governor DeSantis and, and make sure that legislation does not pass. Um, it, would, it would create um, a burden for this organization or this community. And, and, um, and we, we've been, I've enjoyed a good relationship with Governor DeSantis and, and, and working with him every year on a few issues like that. So I appreciate the question. Um, does that answer your question or do you have anything else? Um, just did you go to Tallahassee to talk about this? We, well, we, we sometimes, during session, when the session is going on, we'll go to Tallahassee and, and talk to our state representatives. Most, most of them are the community ones that we all know here, our local delegation. And we will express our interest in, in remaining um, a, a public uh, asset and a public entity. 
um, and not having changes to our enabling legislation or to state law that would, that would um, um, make that different. And the fact that Lee County is now on the price. Well, Lee, Lee County, Lee Health, um, uh, has its own um, issues, and, and, and whatever they do is, is, is what they do. Um, uh, the bill that enabled them to be able to do that was a local delegation bill um, that went forward and then ultimately passed the state legislature. Um, uh, I know that they had tried to put that bill through a couple of times as more of an of a, of a overall state um, law, and we, we opposed that. But, but when, when you're dealing with just local issues, we, you know, that really, we didn't have, a, uh, didn't have an opinion on that. So I, I think that that community has addressed how they would best go forward. Our community certainly feels differently. Are there any questions or comments that you want to um, I, you know, so, so now we're getting really super um, detailed into the legal um, issues, and I'm, I'm, before I get in too much trouble trying to answer something I'm not very qualified for, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll let Carol Ann take a stab at, at that. Thank you, Dave. So, what is the purpose of the Medicaid Act? Um, and what is this board has been very resistant and also very proactive in ensuring that Sarasota Memorial was able to exist as a public hospital. A key thing that the board did was implement what in a corporate world would be considered to be almost like a poison pill to have within our charter a requirement that if, irrespective of any other laws of general application, that if this hospital was going to have hospitals that were under another control or were going to be transferred, that it would have to go to a community referendum. That's specific to Sarasota Memorial. Um, we, as you know, would only be able to take that action if it was at the behest of the board following board action. So we, not, we have our own referendum requirement within our enabling legislation that would apply regardless of general laws that might be changed. Um, our opposition to the general law that David referred to in Tallahassee is kind of one of the many times that we fought to ensure that there's a robust public health care system in Florida. But we have also girded ourselves to make sure that if the public health care system is not um, living up to our standards, that we would remain public. One of the big things that, again, this board did with Foresight about 15 years ago was ensure that where necessary, that we could operate extraterritorially, that we were not conscripted by the boundaries of the district, as long as we didn't use tax revenue to do that. I will tell you that Lee Memorial has repeatedly put forward as the main driver for their need to become a for or a not-for-profit or a private healthcare system is their inability to extend beyond the boundaries of Lee County. That's been at the, the forefront of their argument to both the legislature and to their community about why they're limited and what they can do in the absence of this proposed conversion. Madam Chair, can I just add a comment? And I've been on the board almost 10 years, and I think Greg Carter would verify the suit. There's been no uh, effort by board or board member to advocate a privatization of this hospital. And uh, I think that's still the position of the board and uh, that has not changed. Madam Chair, yes. uh, in light of the conversation we just had, I move that a standing rule be added to the Sarasota Memorial Hospital Board rules requiring that any action which may result in the conversion of Sarasota County Public Hospital District to a non-profit entity and or do away with the public publicly elected hospital board require a unanimous vote of the board for passage. I am not sure that the board has the power to require a unanimous vote on something like that. It is dealt with in the charter. You could have 
I need to look at that, Mr. Rowey. I, I didn't know you were going to propose that. I would have I would have done some research on whether or not the board can change, because under your charter, you you have parameters set when you can do and not do certain things, and you can change internal rules and you can have higher standards than in your charter. But I'm not positive that you can change the requirements of the charter. Can, can I look at that and, and y'all can bring that back? I, I don't think anyone here would vote any differently, but I want to make sure y'all aren't accidentally backing into doing something that's not supported by your ability to act. Well, if the worst that could happen is it's found, it's found to be um, not enforceable in a court of law. That would be the worst case scenario. Well, I, I would say that taking action that you are thinking might be found to be unsupportable in a court of law without having any notice for it would also potentially violate the notice provisions of that's the why, That's meeting. why I made it a standing rule and not a, not a, not a, um, uh, a change of the bylaws. It's certainly up to the chair whether or not she wants to rule that out of order as not having been noticed. Um, I would there's highly no, recommend. There's no notice required to stand in rules, only for, only for five or changes. But you're enacting a standing rule that changes the majority rule requirement for something that is already addressed in the charter. That concerns me, and I think the board deserves to have some analysis of what your ability to do that is before you vote on it. I think that the general public here in the sunshine needs to understand which members of this board are for privatization and which ones are not. So I'm giving everyone an opportunity to show that they are not for privatization. It's a one sentence motion. It's not really too hard to understand. It's not hard to understand, but you may not be allowed to do it. I don't want you guys to do things for show that don't bind the board. If you want to have a, a voice or a show of hands, of any, if you want to say you could do something like that as a ceremonial vote, but you're actually asking to change the rules of the board, I think that's a very dangerous slope to start doing things that haven't been noticed, that potentially are binding on the board, and that the, the ultimate result in challenging it would have to be either undoing it by, by board action, which you could simply do at your next board meeting to vote on it and not have to undo it or, or table it. If you want to show of hands of people who want to say to the public whether or not they're in support of privatization, I think that's completely appropriate. And I want to vote on my motion. I, I think as chair, I we dealt with this back in January. We really would like to have the information before we are in the situation. Um, as I think Tran just stated, nobody, I don't believe anybody on this board has any goal of privatization. And I agree with Carol Ann, I'm happy to have a show of hands, but I, as the chair, I would feel more comfortable that we do not vote to put anything in place until we've had Carol Ann look into this. There's no reason to rush something just to show how our feelings are to the community. That's not the purpose. The purpose is- I, I, I stand where I am. Like, we're not going to vote on, on your change to this in this situation. On the Roberts, I'm entitled to a vote on my motion. There's, that's just, there's been no second. And we're trying, we're not opposed to what you're saying. We're trying to work with you here. I understand what you're saying. However, on Roberts 49.21, section two, no second is required because we're a small board in that we have less than 12 members. I think because of the notice requirements that the chair could rule the motion out of order. It, it was not noticed. There has not been any preparation for it. It wasn't agenda. There hasn't been an opportunity to be heard on it. I agree that if there was a notice requirement, that would be true. But for a standing rule, there is no notice requirement, only for a, a bylaw change. So you're proposing a change to the voting power of the members of the board, and you're characterizing it as a standing rule, but that is not the subject of a standing rule. Standing rule is not supposed to change the voting power of members of the body. Your, your motion, 
I'm not the chair, but your motion is out of order. And my, the stated reason for your motion was that the public deserves to know if anyone on the board is in favor of privatization. That can be done in this public meeting in the absence of board action. Each individual board member can make a public expression of what they believe about that in the absence of potentially violating their obligation of stewardship and fiduciary responsibility by voting on a motion that wasn't noticed and, and is potentially out of order and may be undertaking activity that no board member or the majority of the board has the power to do. I may have suggest something. Uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, an appropriate thing for us to vote on. I think that to get at the heart of the matter is why don't we just take a strong poll and uh, state our opinions. I've obviously stated my opinion. Uh, and I would encourage the others uh, to state their opinion and maybe that will satisfy the issue. I, I don't think we can change our rules without some deliberation. And I, I hear about Robert's rules and I went to get the book, uh, but I just don't think in this collegial body that you can uh, ask us to do something like that without some deliberation. And if the issue is privatization, I'm here to say I am opposed to privatization of this house. Okay, the, the problem with that, that's, that's normally that would be fine. The problem is that come November, you're not going to be here, right? That's true. I mean, what I'm looking to do here is to buy future boards from privatizing the hospital. With all the I, rest, I, I just really don't think we can do that with a vote here. Uh, maybe the resolution should be that this board reaffirms its position to remain a public hospital. Maybe that should be the resolution. Well, and we can, we can ask the council to go ahead and look for ways. We can we ask council to look for ways. Here, thank you. Uh, we can ask council to look for ways to strengthen our current structure and come back with a report of what we can do, can't do. And we can do this job with any kind of So, I, I, and Patty, thanks for bringing this up. You opened up a. Oh, yeah, okay. so thank you for doing it. And um, I'm glad to say I, I want no change. You know, I, Neither do I. No one on this board <clears throat> since I've been here has ever, ever spoken about But there's been some, some press or some discussion yeah. or whatever. And <clears throat> I, I think right. people are trying to put words in our mouth or say things. And so I think it's appropriate. I'm, I'm glad to stand right now. The trend is out. Uh, well, if we're, we're going to take the straw poll, let's take it then. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the best we can get. Well, and, and you know what? We're we're delaying what you've asked for for a month okay. so it gets done right as opposed to just right. And I think that's what you're I agree with that yeah. at this point. I, I think we're all we don't even have a copy of what you're proposing in front of us, but. With that said, I think we just do a straw poll right now. Um, Sharon, can we hear from you? Well, I know there's been a lot of talk. I know that there has been a lot of talk about privatizing this hospital. And uh, we've been, uh, the board members that are up for re-election have been at forums. And we've all stated our opinions on that subject. And we all stated that we are not in favor of it. And so um, I stand uh, with the with the rest with, with my other colleagues here, and uh, that decision. And um, and I don't think this is something that we need to discuss today. I agree with you that we need to table it for future future discussion after we get some research on. And thank you, Caroline, for that. Okay. Thank you. Just heard from Tran and Brad. Bridget, would you like to speak? Yeah, I'm against privatizing the hospital. But we should also hear from Vic, too. I mean, even though he brought us forward, you know, I, I would like to know. And I just, yeah, I don't want to be bullied into making a, a, a quick decision and not have all the facts. I mean, I think we all know where we stand, but we want to do it the right way. Thank you. Patty? I concur with you 100%. Greg? 
Greg says, no, it's a big no. And that. Does that mean no privatization? Yeah, that's what it means for anybody. What else could it mean? I absolutely positively oppose privatization under all circumstances. Bill, can you hear us? I believe you're on. I can hear you. I am completely opposed to privatizing this hospital. Okay, thank you so much. And I, as well, am completely against privatizing this hospital in any circumstances. Um, yeah. I'm in this price. Yes, grab him. Okay. Um, we will table this and come back to it um, in the future. So thank you. That's great. Any other comments? No, I was going to say it's great. Okay. I was going to say make sure we're going to show that there's a canvas. Yes. That's, that's, there we that's go. Always. It's always been. Yes. Yeah. With that said, there is no consent agenda, so we're going to move on to public comments. Um, at this time, I want to just remind everybody that because we have 12 speakers, the comments will be limited to three minutes. Um, I would ask that you remember the rules of civility and that you will not interrupt as people are um, up on the stand. Um, and because of the time clock, we will let them know when the time is there. Um, I also want to bring up, there's been several comments that um, we are not responding or um, during this discussion. And um, I want to thank those that bring their personal matters up here. They are important and their concerns are very important to this board. With that said, we are governed um, and we have privacy rules here. So we may not be responding in this setting, um, but we will be following up when necessary uh, afterwards. So. With that said, I'm going to announce the first speaker and then the second um, following that, if you can be prepared. Um, and you'll just need to come to the stand and announce your name and where you are from. Shannon Spring, followed by John Capel. Is Shannon still here? Okay. So we will move on to John Capel and Immediately following John is Sally Nista. Thank you. I'm John Capel. And my comments, my criticisms uh, are about the time during the pandemic. I know that the hospital does a lot of good work, and I appreciate that. Let's keep politics out of medicine and focus on patient care at Sarasota Memorial. I agree. Vermont said, in years, medical freedom activists have been researching and quoting from medical and scientific studies about how this hospital used protocols that were not only ineffective, but downright dangerous. One example, when Visivir, which the hospital still uses to this day, despite the fact that the original clinical trial to test its efficacy, 53% of the subjects actually died. So when a hospital board member goes to a major national newspaper to denigrate our side, saying that we're politicizing the situation here, how ironic and hypocritical that is, but it is exactly what that member is doing, lying and politicizing. For example, we want the hospital to stay public so that we can ensure transparency and have sufficient access and public comment. However, however, who is it that has reduced our public comment by 70%? First, reducing the amount of time we could speak from five minutes to three minutes, and then making the public comment available only once every two months, unlike every month, which is what it was for years. When people break their word, their commitment, especially to humanity in pursuit of the almighty dollar, it is a stain, <coughs> a stain on their character. When God can hear even the footsteps of an ant and see everything, then surely he can see how certain board members either drink the government Kool-Aid to absolve themselves of guilt or knowingly take government money at the expense of patients' health and well-being, or both. When you sell your soul for money, there's always a heavy price to pay. Why do you target and harass doctors here at the hospital who want to treat patients as individuals with what they consider to be the appropriate medicine and protocol, but that protocol is not a government-approved protocol? Are you following government dictates or medicine? And by the way, speaking of making things political, when Florida's own Surgeon General, who has prestigious credentials, tells you, tells the whole state, the bioweapon, also known as the COVID, 
COVID vaccine is dangerous, once it permanently alters the genome and should be banned, why is it that you don't put that significant information on your website? Is it because you drink the government Kool-Aid, be the CDC, the Center for Death Control, or the or via the FDA, the Food and Death Administration? Or is it because you take dirty money from the government or Big Pharma? The people in the audience don't know any better, but you do. Thank you, John. Next up, Sally Niska, followed by Saul Kostin. Good afternoon, my name is Sally Niska, and I signed a speaker card. I know this might be a little repetitive, but considering you didn't take a vote, I think it's important to say. Let's take a little look at history and then a prediction forward. In 2020, the Florida legislature had a huge appetite for privatization. Deals stuck, struck in back rooms with public companies and entities that went private were big payouts to CEOs and board members. In 2022, our own Senator Joe Bruders co-sponsored a bill that sails through the Florida House and Senate allowing public hospitals to go private. Governor DeSantis vetoes that bill. Maybe it was because he knew he was going to run for president and the public loves their public agencies. That would be a bad look for him, so he stops it in the tracks. In 2023, the legislature passes a specific bill allowing Lee County Hospital, which was public, to go private. Sarasota Memorial is now the only hospital in the state that is public. In 2024, we have contentious hospital work races. The current and pro-establishment candidates scream that the pro-freedom candidates are planning on making SMH private. They hinge that statement on General Michael Flynn's comments that SMH's current board is acting like a private hospital. SMH refuses to do an independent audit that voters are requesting. SMH refuses to put the Florida Surgeon General's informative statements on their website. SMH shortens public comment. Ms. Lodge, would you like me to wait so you can finish hearing? No, I can hear Okay, you. thank you. I have to say, General Flynn has a point. If you study Marxism and Rules for Radical Silence, you know that one of its favorite tactics is to claim your opponent is doing what you're doing. So, I'm taking bets. Anyone want to take me up on my prediction that SMH will be private in less than five years? It will be the current CEO, administration, some board members, and that make hay with that deal. And Sarasota County voters will be left in the dark with a wonderful private, non-profit hospital in Sarasota County. Sal Kilstein, followed by Brenda Pastoric. Thank you. I'm Sol Kilstein, and I'm a full-time resident to Sarasota County. For the past two years, I've focused on the board's responsibility to provide health and welfare for the patients and staff of SMH through rigorous science. Today, I'm taking a different path. I'm appealing to your commitment to carry out the board's fiduciary responsibilities as trustees for the entire Sarasota Memorial Hospital system. For almost half my career, I worked in government and philanthropy. Most of that time was spent writing and administering Medicare and Medicaid laws and regulations and overseeing major philanthropic grants. Despite the rhetoric and misinformation presented to the board, and calls to get government out of your way. Failing to follow CMS, CDC, FDA, and other government regulations will result in Sarasota Memorial Hospital becoming an empty shell. Remember too, federal laws and regulations preempt contradictory, politically inspired, scientifically flawed state laws and guidelines, like those coming from our Surgeon General. Gross revenues by payer class, according to your own 2024 financial report, shows that Medicare accounted for 66% of your revenues, and Medicaid 6%. That's over 70% of SMH revenues. If you no longer meet Medicare conditions of participation, that revenue stream is immediately at risk. Your bond ratings also 
needed to finance all your grand plans for future capital expansion would become junk. And philanthropies, and I know about foundations, would operate, which operate on their own strict fiduciary guidelines, would no longer consider SMH to be a prudent investment. Bottom line, no matter how strong the political winds blow, you cannot survive without operating within full adherence to federal rules and regulations. So you have to have a serious conversation with your chief financial officer and your lawyers, and then work with your political and public relations advisors accordingly to fend off disaster. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda Pastoric, followed by Sherry Stone. Good afternoon. I've been a pastor, 25-year resident of Sarasota, and my husband Bonnie died here on September 29th, 2021. I have since that time been advocating for a change in the policies and procedures at SMH, and have come to the conclusion that these changes can only occur with a change in the hospital board. July 11th, I heard candidates at a meeting read hosted by the League of Women Voters, which opened up the wounds of pain calling the experience, and finally, Bonnie's death alone in SMH. This was a night of cover-up and tooting the horn of praise for the investigation that we forced to be done. But it was the hospital investigating itself and ended up being a promotional advertisement for the hospital. It was stated that SMH did not mandate employees to get vaccinated, which was debunked when an email was presented showing evidence of same. Um, another candidate was very proud of the fact that she had been able to get approval for deaths to be with moms during labor, as she had demanded it. So the rules were being overruled, but not for family members of loved ones with COVID. In another conversation, I asked why SMH did not have adequate staff during COVID. And I had to call the nurse's station to get water for my husband when no one responded to his call then. I was assured that an additional $6 million had been spent for this purpose. My answer to this is why did they not allow me to put on PPE gear and be in the hospital to meet simple needs and to be a comfort to my husband and for him to know that he was not alone. I had already had COVID and would not have been a risk or a risk to the patients or staff and mine was post-COVID. I had ivermectin in his name at home, but was not able to get it to him. She stated then that it was his doctor's fault. However, Monty was assigned to hospital doctors who did not know his medical background. There seemed to be a different one every day, and I can never get a call back from any of them. The government protocols being followed at SMH plus the use of remdesivir has proven to be a deadly combination, and I've witnessed many other older couples Staying home and using early protocols by Dr. Peter McCullough if they are still alive. Dad and Walter entry, Matt Walsh, and the original observers said, get over it. COVID has passed. Wouldn't they just all of us to do that? But that will never happen. This propelled me to get the widows of Sarasota back together. And we're going to be doing a televised uh, program, telling our heart reaching stories again and giving updates of our lives. Living going on today. You try living on a social security check and even with a part-time job. It's difficult to make ends meet in today's inflation. We endorse the Medical Freedom Hospital Board candidates, Dr. Gufani, Rosa Mosser, Mary Neal, and Tanya Perez, who do not want to privatize the hospital, but will give us freedom to choose our own doctors and medical treatment. Thank you. Next is Sherry Thornton, followed by Rudy Brandwine. Okay. Sorry, Ruth. It's Ruth. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Board. My name is Sherry Thornton, and I'm a resident of Venice, Florida. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And part of that's in recognition of um, Sarasota Memorial and um, the Venice location. I happen to have uh, an unfortunate encounter with fire ants and started having an anaphylaxis reaction. So I was taken to Sarasota Memorial, um, or 
Sarasota of Venice, and was there and promptly admitted um, into the ER and had a wonderful care team that met my needs. When I presented in the ER, I was having labor breathing, my face and eyes were swelling shut, and I had a full body rash. So they scooted me in, and eight to ten of my newest, closest friends were there taking care of me and making sure that I had a full recovery. So I came today to thank you, and I am extremely grateful for the care and services that you provide and for the high standards that you demand of your care teams. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ruth Brandywine, followed by Vicki Nightswander. Hello, uh, my name is Ruth Brandwine and I'm a resident of Sarasota. Uh, I'll speak very briefly. Um, in March, we Boom voters had a meeting at the uh, Selby Library regarding uh, the hospital. We had a, a speaker who was a member of the Hospital Foundation. We had a speaker who was a doctor who was the head of the new research program. And on Zoom, we had a national expert on privatization. At that time, he was able to explain to the audience of over 100 people the problems of privatization, particularly when it's taken over by a um, uh, financial firm that's just in for making money. Uh, and I think that that meeting brought to the fore the issue and the dangers of privatization. Uh, what he said briefly was that when hospitals privatized nationally, there's evidence, there's data that shows the quality goes down, many of the doctors leave, uh, often they bring out the money, they, take, they eliminate services like maternity care and mental health, which are not money makers, and essentially it goes down. So I'm very pleased to hear that no one on this board is interested in privatization. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Vicki, next water, followed by Lisa Rolette. Hi everyone, I'm Vicki Nicewander, and uh, I'm a Sarasota resident, and um, I just want to briefly mention that in 2013 you dealt with this issue, and you might look back at your minutes from March 18th, 2013 to um, discuss this as part of the review, so that's what I have to say today, thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Next is Lisa Rallette, followed by William Barrow. I was going to spend most of my comments talking about the contaminated mRNA COVID vaccines, but with privatization coming up, I'll address that, um, because I am also incredibly concerned about privatization. It was not on my radar at all um, a couple months ago, and then there was just a big buzz about it. So I did research, and a couple of things that concern me is at the state legislature level, there's a huge appetite and support for privatization. 2022, our own state senator, Joe Bruders, co-sponsored a bill for privatization. I don't know why he would do that. Um, I don't know why he would do that if everybody here is so strong against it. It just concerns me. The other thing is I just read an article that a former chief legal counsel here suggested that if the election does not go his way or go the way he wants, that one consideration is to keep calling this a public hospital, but instead of having a publicly elected board, you have an appointed board. So you're still calling it public, but you're appointing it, you're not electing it. That concerns me. The other thing that concerns me is, so I, I sat there and I'm like, how likely is this? And I thought, okay, nine board members here. I thought through each of you and I thought, what is the likelihood that you're gonna support privatization What's the likelihood you're going to support appointment? What is the likelihood you're going to stay strong and let us keep choosing our board members? 
And I think about it, and I, I don't feel valued as a member of the public. I don't feel valued at all. I have fact-filled emails that I sent to you. Silence. I asked to speak with you, I asked to meet with you. Silence. Last meeting, May. Pretty much no one said they'd even meet with me. So I look at it, and you're acting like you don't appreciate the public. So I, I do have concerns. I would think there's merit in maybe even calling for a meeting next week, and then being on record and saying, we are not in support of having a, a, a appointed board either. Because you can still call yourself public, but be appointed. And that's the other thing. We are due to be the last public hospital standing in the entire state of Florida with a publicly elected board. Right now, there's just two. There's us and Lee Health. Lee Health is set to privatize as of October. Right now, we are the last publicly elected hospital in the entire state of Florida. Last one standing. We have to safeguard it. We have to protect it. So I would ask that you call for coming back next week, everybody on record, safeguard our ability to keep voting for our, for our um, public board members. Because the red flags we've been able to bring to you, the COVID vaccines, I was hoping to speak about that. We've got kids who are getting injected with things that can cause them cancer. I love the ability to keep speaking to you guys about that, and I want to keep that going strong. Um, I think I've said everything about just this power. Oh, yeah, with the 2022 bill with Joe Bruder's co sponsoring, there was not a single vote against it in the House, not a single vote against it in the State Senate. There was not a single committee, at least for the House. I'm sorry. Next, William Barrow, followed by Tanzan Rosen Watson. Hi, my name is William Dombro. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, should have been a doctor. Here, right? so I'm sorry, I mispronounced. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I walked in here and I wasn't sure I was in the right meeting because uh, the last time I was here it was packed. People, uh, when we thought that we were going to have a, uh, get a vote on whether or not to uh, include Dr. Uh, Surgeon General about a uh, statement regarding the uh, jab and the warning against it on the uh, Sarasota Memorial website. Now, they're not here, and uh, I don't know why, you know, the room gets packed with uh, controversial issues that uh, controversial issues come up, that the board needs uh, a lot of uh, agreement with, uh, but uh, the general public in Sarasota feels the same way. The first gentleman who spoke said it all, and uh, those that spoke afterwards <laughs> as well. Nobody wants privatization in this hospital. Um, I'll tell a personal story. I was up for a funeral service in uh, Maryland. Uh, a friend had died. Uh, next door neighbors we were friends with sitting around outside at the memorial service. And uh, one of them asked me, was I a max name? Just while uh, we were just sitting around doing and uh, I said, no. She said, why not? I said, well, it's my body, my choice, right? Tell you that lady's dead. She had uh, been vaxxed, boosted, uh, as many times as you can get, suffered two strokes, was dead. I believe because of the vaccine, vaccine, it's not vaccine, you had to change it to the definition vaccine in order to uh, get this poison to uh, show up in writing as something that uh, is beneficial to people. I think that the uh, hospital protocols kill most people. I don't know too many people have died of COVID. Remdesivir, yeah, probably hundreds of thousands. And for those who couldn't be with their families, and personal contact, seniors, mothers, fathers, brothers, daughters. Uh, I'd like to take the last 15 seconds for a moment of silence for them. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next up is Tamsin, followed by Barbara Vaughn. I'm Tamsin Rosen, officer MD. I'm not an outsider. I came here when I was a teenager. I was gone during medical school. I came back. I've been a legal resident since 1997. Um, I would like to say that the United States of America went from a third world backwater to the leader in medical care, science, and everything else in less than 200 years without government protocols, mandates, or regulations. In 1940, there was no such thing as an antibiotic. Nearly everything we know about medical care, medicine, and science we've learned in about the last 80 years. I worked to get some of you on this board elected a few years ago, and I am very disappointed. Okay, uh, there have been things in the newspaper accusing me of things that I've never discussed with any of you. Um, one person said that the board is not involved in medical decisions, but admits they made medical decisions by following CDC guidelines. The medical bureaucrats, governments, people in the CDC do not practice medicine. They do not take responsibility for actual human beings. I have all my life. It's not a, pol a political thing. I was dedicated to my patients, whether they were the chiefs of industry or armed robbers. Okay? So, I have no personal agenda. And I would like to say that privatization is the wrong word. Corporatization is the word. Okay? I would challenge any of you here. Does anyone besides me in this room read the New England Journal of Medicine? July 11th, quote, Medicare Advantage and Consolidation is a new frontier. The danger of united health care for all. What we're talking about with privatization is corporatization where people in hospitals work for health care exchange traded equities, that is, shareholders on Wall Street. We're not talking about Danny Thomas creating a charitable hospital. There are a few left. You can look up the Deborah Heart and Lung Hospital, the Shriners Hospital, St. Jude Hospital for Children. Okay, that's private. We're not talking about that. We're talking about corporatization. I'm totally against it. I would ask uh, not to be quoted in the newspaper as having said or done something I've never said or done. Um, I'm not interested in stirring a pot and advancing personal agendas. I'm interested in, in life. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you, Tamsin. Next up is Barbara Vaughn. My name is Barbara Vaughn, and I'm a 17-year permanent resident of Sarasota County. Shortly after I came here, I got involved in elections for the first time in my life. I spent 28 years in the Air Force, and we were subject to the Hatch Act. I quickly realized that to vote for Sarasota Memorial Hospital board members, you had to go all the way to the bottom of the ballot, and most people didn't. People who ran for this hospital board had their family and friends to vote for them, but very few members of the public had no clue who they were. But then came COVID, and everything changed. Today, voters are very much aware of Sarasota Memorial Hospital and its board members especially after the unconscionable treatment of some COVID patients and their families. Out of that sadness, and yes, anger, came the push for medical freedom. It's a pretty simple concept that's been completely twisted by people who are invested in maintaining the status quo. 
please don't turn it into a dirty word or words, because it isn't. Basically, it just encompasses the recent motion passed by this very board, allowing patients and their advocates to work with their doctors regarding treatments and medications. Not care directed by Sarasota Memorial Hospital based on financial incentives from the government. One thing you can be sure of is that nobody in favor of medical freedom is in the least interested in privatizing this hospital. On the contrary, they are private citizens who believe we need some changes at SMH, but privatization is not one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. We have, that was our last speaker, um, so now we're going to go on to legal matters. Carol Lance. Just very briefly, y'all will recall that last month I let you know that we were about to file a statutorily required performance review that was performed by an outside independent auditor that was filed. It was dated June 14th and was filed as it was required to be in Tallahassee with various government departments. The, Chief Financial Officer, President of the Senate, and the Speaker of the House. Um, we will, Karen will be forwarding it to you. There were no significant findings. The one recommendation that came out of it was that you more formally adopt the financial guardrails, and um, you talked about them today. Jeff talked about them to, with you today in, in setting the budget. Um, and so we will be bringing that to you. Um, these are the guardrails about the ratios of debt and days cash on hand and, and things like that, um, that the board has had standing and has has worked. They've really been a bit of a living document for uh, more than 10 years. But we'll do that more formally and then it'll become a more formal part of the reporting process as a bar rail report. But that was really it. They were uh, very impressed with the breadth and complexity of the organization and with the organization's both plans and activities to fulfill its mission. So again, look for that in your email boxes. It's, as I said, about 110 pages long. Um, it's dense but readable, and um, that was our statutory obligation. We, we do performance reviews all the time, but this was something that the legislature asked us to do. Thank you for that update. Does anybody have any questions for Kelly? Any other business we need to discuss? Well, having completed our agenda, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.